Keep those clapping hands out because we're going to give a warm Mission Viejo welcome to Lauren Oliver. <laughs> Before I Fall 
is realistic with a bit of fantasy. I wrote a dystopian series. I've done two middle grades. Next year I have a realistic YA and my first adult novel coming out. So basically I'm really across the board. Um, and, uh, and I think that's also because, again, I have read from an early age, I read everything I could get my hands on and I would kind of try to write every, in all these different categories. Um, I didn't actually study writing in high school or middle school um, or even college, but I continued writing on my own. Um, when I got into mi um, around middle school, I stopped doing as much fan fiction. I started for the first time generating my own stories. This story that I'm about to tell in proves to you what I just the point I just made about having no natural talent as a writer. <laughs> in middle school, my writing was pre pre predominantly consigned to these magazines that I would write for my best friend, Jackie, who is still, incidentally, my best friend. Um, <laughs> but I would write for these magazines, and they would feature like horoscopes and embarrassing stories and whatever you usually find in a, a magazine for people of that age. And the centerpiece of the stories would be a fiction piece in which she would, through, against all odds, end up <coughs> finding out that all along, John Lippincott had a crush on her, and they would make out at the end of the story, and I would find out that Mike Nettle loved me, and we would make out at the end of the story. So that's how it worked. And I recently actually found in a, a, one of these examples, actually she had kept it, which is furious, wow. infuriating, and embarrassing, and the title of this story is, wait for it, So He Hates Me, Who Cares, I Do, Subtitled Tears and Kisses. <laughs> relationship with generating terrible titles for my novels and having them be titles. Um, anyway, so that proves that I, again, like I said, I had no natural talent. But I kept on writing. I, I first attempted to write my first novel when I was in a uh, freshman in high school. It was going to be a modernized version of a Jane Austen story. Um, so that's when I first started to try to write a longer piece. Because the other thing that practice gives you is a tolerance for getting through those middle sections. I know a lot of young writers who say, I always have these great ideas and then at page 30, goes down in flames. That's very normal. It takes a really long time to learn how to string so many pages on top of each other. So I started attempting to write a novel when I was a freshman in high school. I finished my first novel when I was a senior in college. So about eight years had elapsed. It wasn't the same novel, thankfully. <laughs> I wasn't working the same novel for eight years. That's when I finally finished a novel. Um, at that point, I submitted to agents in New York. Um, and I actually got an agent, and I was thrilled. I had dreams of literary stardom. I thought I was going to get a profile piece in New York Times. That did not happen. My first novel was rejected by all the publishers to whom it was sent on the basis of that, the fact that it had no plot, which I guess is important. Um, <laughs> it was actually not, however, a criticism I understood at the time. I didn't really know what that meant. Um, so I, I was undeterred. It helps to be a little bit, um, it helps to be self confident, bordering on. Uh, delusional as a writer. Um, so I was undeterred. I decided to write another book. I wrote a whole other book. That one suffered the same fate. At this point, I was around 24, 25, and I decided that, you know, I graduated with a degree in philosophy and literature, which meant, of course, I was working in a bar. And I decided that <laughs> the future of having, you know, drunken Chicago men throw walled up napkins on my head was not exactly what I wanted with, to do with my degree. So I decided to go back to school. I was going to go get a literature degree. Because, as I said, my parents were both literature professors. My parents actually divorced and both separately remarried professors. My <laughs> sister's a professor. In my family, when you don't know what to do, you become a professor. Um, so I was looking into graduate programs, and I, I stumbled across the fact that you could go to school and get a graduate degree in creative writing. It's a two-year program. You get a master's, not a PhD. Um, and you spend the whole time you're in the program immersed in books and thinking about reading, thinking about writing, writing and you know talking about writing it's writing all the time so the best and the best thing about the program is if you most of the programs if you can get in that you don't have to pay which is good because in case you're considering spending $75,000 on a creative writing degree it's not always the most the best investment it's difficult to convince your parents that it is <laughs> um, even literature professor parents <laughs> especially literature professor parents so i did i applied to school this sounded great to me i, I got in i went to NYU um, I got a master's in creative writing, and, and I learned a lot of things from my time there. I mean, I learned a ton of geeky, 
craft things, my writing got a lot better on the line level and on the character level. Mm -hmm. um, I love talking about writing. I co-own a literary development company just so I can talk about writing all the time. I'm not gonna sit here and bore you with talking about like the ju juxtaposition, juxtaposition of memory and present and stuff, but I could if, if you wanted to. <laughs> um, but the most important thing I learned from my time at NYU was when to accept criticism and when to ignore it. Because I had never workshopped a piece of my writing to an, with an audience before, ever. I'd never shown my writing to anyone except for my father and my, the agent that I'd initially gotten in New York. Um, it was incredibly difficult. It's incredibly difficult to sit and have people fire criticism at you. It's also great preparation for Twitter, which had not been invented yet. <laughs> um, but one thing that really struck me about the NYU workshop experience, and this is not a joke, this was universal. You would bring in a chapter, let's say, of a novel, and there would be 10 people in your workshop, and five of them would say, this story doesn't really have a lot of merit. It's really not hanging together. There's all these problems with it. However, character X is fascinating. I really feel like the heart of your story is with character X. You should just cut out the rest and do characters. The other five would say, um, this story works perfectly except for character X. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, every time, completely conflicting. So you have to figure out kind of who understands your vision and who kind of supports your, your idea of how the writing is going to go and learn to listen to them and to everyone else say thank you, but, you know, you're, but no thank you. And I think that's an important lesson to learn, both in terms of writing and in terms of life, because everybody always has an opinion about what you you choose to do, and um, and some people really understand and really encourage you to be kind of your best self, and other people, you know, their opinions are their opinions, but not really relevant to what you want to do. Um, one thing I did not learn how to do at NYU was tell a story. I actually wrote an 800-page novel twice when I was at NYU which means that I wrote 1,600 pages in which not a single interesting thing happened, <laughs> which is, I'm always proud of because it's mathematically improbable. It's like a reverse superpower of some kind. Um, so I still really didn't know how to plot a book. Luckily, at the time, I also got a job working at Penguin Books in their young adult department. I did not know much about teen books at this time because when I was a teen, there actually weren't a lot of teen books. There were a couple series, um, pretty insubstantial series, you know, Baby Search Club, Sweet Valley High, not that I didn't love them, but you were done reading them by the time you were like 12. Um, and then there was this big gap between when you were 12 and 25, um, <laughs> where you were, could either be reading Faulkner or nothing. Um, and so I really didn't know that in the past 10 years, there had been this huge explosion, this tremendous breadth and depth of all of these books being published for and about teens. Um, and when I started working there, the joke in publishing is that you get paid in free books, except it's not really a joke because it's basically true. Um, <laughs> but they, I started working there, and you do. You consume just a huge amount of, of reading materials. And my reading and writing have always been super respondent to one another, as I said. Um, so I started reading all of these teen books, and I was really, really amazed by the fact that they, I was amazed by the storytelling, by the conceptual work and the storytelling. I mean, even when the writing was ridiculous, which it occasionally was, you still could have put them down. You're flipping the pages, you're devouring them in a single night. And um, again, really imaginative frameworks. Uh, you know, whatever, sparkly vampires who go to high school, <laughs> you know, but, but really, it, nobody had done that before. Um, so, especially the sparkly part. Um, but, uh, but anyway, so I started reading all this stuff, and that, it was actually in the capacity as an editor, as I learned to edit stories, that I learned how to tell stories. Um, and I still think that that's really important. That's partly why I started a, a literary development agency, which basically helps people learn how to craft stories, because actually thinking rigorously about storytelling really helps me in my own work. So it was while there that I started on my first book, Before I Fall, which is excellent, and you should all read it. Um, <laughs> and it is a story of a girl named Samantha Kingston, who is very pretty, very popular, quite mean, and as of page three, she's also extremely dead. <laughs> she dies in a car crash on her way home from a party. And the book, in the book, she relives her last day seven times, and it's both about her attempts to unpack the mystery surrounding her death, but also on a deeper level, it's really about her evolution, because she starts off the book as 
really incredibly shallow um somebody that people really revile and hate um kind of a bully she's a mean girl and over the course of these seven days she starts to realize kind of the impact of well she starts to change let's put it that way um before i fall was great i had a great publishing experience with it um and after that i had the dreaded not writer's block exactly because i don't believe in writer's block which me about later, but um, <laughs> but you know, I was worried. What do I write now? What do I do now? Um, particularly once you start publishing, and there's pressure on you to continue publishing relatively decent stuff. Um, <laughs> fortunately, I was able to again fall back on my reading habits. I read a quote around that time. This was years ago because it takes forever for books to make it onto the shelf after you start working on them. So this was probably in 2008. Um, I read a book, a quote from one of my favorite writers, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, who said that all good books are about either love or death. Now, having just written a book in which the main character, title character, basically dies seven times, I thought I'd <laughs> adequately addressed the death theme in my day. So I decided, I thought, wow, it would be so fun to write a book about love. Not a romance, but a book about love, about its place in society, about kind of it, its role in social cohesion, um, and, you know, I was also, being a um, cynical New Yorker, I have ambivalent feelings about love. I mean, yes, love is all good and well, but if you've ever had your heart broken or if you've ever lost somebody, I, my, I was dating a boy for four years, we were engaged, he died in 2009, it's almost killed me. And there were times in my life where if you had told me you could take my heart out so that I wouldn't have to feel pain, I would have absolutely signed up. I would have been like, check yes, you know? So. Those were all the themes I wanted to address in a book about love. But I didn't know how to write it yet. Then several days later, I went to the gym. Um, and this was during like the swine flu panic, um, <laughs> which in New York was really serious because in New York, everybody lives like right on top of each other. Um, so people in New York were going crazy. They were pulling their kids out of school. You couldn't buy hand sanitizer anywhere. They were like literally buying it in bulk and then bathing in it, like showering in it. <laughs> And, um, and I went to the gym, and it was so disappointing because in the end, nobody even died. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I went to the gym, and I was watching a news program about this, and I was started thinking, you know, it's really difficult, it's really easy to be driven into a pain over fears of, in that case,